Good afternoon. My name is Jim Mitri, and until recently, I was a senior advisor to the Deputy Secretary of Defense. My job was to help establish the CDAO. And the CDAO, the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Officer, just hit full operating capability last week. Now, in the Department of Defense, oftentimes after a mission, they'll be held what's often referred to as a hot wash, which is an opportunity to reflect on the mission, tease out some of the key lessons learned, and think about the implications for the future. So in the spirit of a hot wash, the Deputy Secretary and I are now going to engage in a fireside chat to review some of the thinking and really understand her observations and insights about the CDAO. No further ado, it is my distinct privilege and honor to introduce uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Dr. Kathleen Hicks. Hi, good afternoon, Jim. And I note there's no fire, but I'm letting it go. We'll fireside <laughs> chat regardless. Indeed. Um, great. Well, one of the things that I'm interested in understanding a little bit more, and I suspect many on the line are as well, is some of the initial observations you had when you first came into the Department of Defense and were thinking that there is a specific problem here that you were trying to solve with the CDAO. How do you think about articulating that problem? Sure. So, um, uh as you know, Jim, I'm, I'm at my heart sort of a strategist and I think in a systems level approach. So I certainly didn't walk into the department and say, I'm a, a software programmer, a data, data analyst, or I know how to build, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a software engineer. Um, it really was coming in, seeing all the things we want to achieve um, for the nation, for the nation's defense and then um, understanding the kinds of concepts and capabilities that lead to that and how what opportunity we had here based on what had been built before us in data, in um, the digital space, and of course on AI, and how we had this opportunity to really move forward on our mission space if we could capitalize on that, th those um, moves that had come before. So that was sort of the, the underlying sense I had. Um, and uh, the more I talked to the communities of interest, learned what they were doing, got excited about the types of capabilities they could bring to bear, and tied that, um, if you will, bottom up. I don't, I don't mean that in any disparaging way, but from that sense that they had at that operational level of what they could provide with those big strategic problems that we were looking at, uh, it was a very natural next step. Um, we, we took that step with a lot of advisement. We talked a lot with Congress. We talked with folks on the outside, The certainly the... Um, AI commission folks, we, uh, I asked for commission two separate independent studies of what commercial best practice was, um, and certainly talked to our own workforce. And coming out of that really it became clear that something like what we now call CDAO was the best way to think about the tech stack that would help us unlock a lot of what we need in the department. Excellent. One thing that you've talked a lot about is the importance of using data to inform decision making and to provide you and the secretary with decision advantage, if you will, from the boardroom to the battlefield. Um, I'd love to understand a little bit more about how you think about using data and some of the observations in terms of trying to work with where the department is today on having data inform your decision making. Absolutely. So, um, uh, Jim, you know all too well, I'm an analyst at heart and uh, I like decisions to be based on facts and knowledge, and uh, we should all hope that that's the case. Uh, we sit, I sit uh, as the COO of DOD on top of the largest organization in the world, and we are um, undergunned in terms of the analytic capability that we tend to bring toward problems relative to the scale of both our size and then the kinds of the consequences of the challenges we're looking at. And so uh, uh, data is, an, is another uh, way, an avenue toward better analysis, better fact finding, understanding how to see ourselves, understanding how to see our adversaries um, and, and all the other facets um, of a situation. So if I wanna ask a question on um, sustainment, where 70% of our funds and acquisition aren't going toward a platform, they're going to the sustainment side, um, I need to have an understanding of where that money goes and what the drivers are and how we can fix it. If I'm asking a question or the secretary is asking a question about the logistics flow of material into uh, Ukraine, well, let's look at the data of where that logistics flow is, what are our munition stocks, uh, what are the risks. Data informs 
all of that. And I think what we've been able, because we are stepping into um, leadership in this period of time, we're able to show that promise, um, you know, the little peek under the tent about what unlocking data can do. And then if you can add predictive analysis to it, mm -hmm. what if we could really analyze all that data in a way right. that's speedy with AI and also even then be predictive? Uh, that uh, shows so much potential, as you said, from the from the boardroom side, as that sustainment example shows. And then, as you get closer in the um, you know sensor to shooter piece of it, you start to see the advantage for data and for AI and the CDO construct again as that tech stack um, comes tighter together and there's a virtuous feedback cycle in really giving the United States that advantage on the decision on decision making side accuracy uh, prediction side mm -hmm. excellent now as a strategist and analyst it's not lost on us that while you were thinking about creating the CDAO you were also working on the national defense strategy um, would love to learn a little bit more about what you see as the key elements of the strategic context that should inform the CDAO as it embarks on its work. Absolutely. I, I, as as I, I hope um, my examples I just gave demonstrate, almost any strategy the United States would have right now would benefit from a CDAO. So it's 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 um, I think it's an enduring concept, uh, and again builds on what's come before. And I would anticipate. Um, in the future, anyone would continue to build on this no matter what their NDS is. That said, this NDS is very much aligned um, to what we're trying to achieve with the CDAO stand-up and, of course, what the broader community is trying to achieve across um, all the digital and data spaces. So um, that includes, for instance, in this strategy, the three ways that we go about the strategy. The first and, and most overarching and integrative is integrated deterrence. And there we're, we're focused on how do we bring uh, combat credibility, how do we bring combat power across the spectrum of conflict from below the subconventional level up through the strategic level across all the domains, air, land, sea, space, cyber. Mm -hmm. How do we work with allies? Um, well, guess what? Data is how we share data, mm -hmm. how we operate together um, with a common operating picture, as we might have called it, you know, a mere 20 years ago. That is vital to integrated deterrence. Um, and I think we, as I said, in the sensor to shooter side, there's a lot of opportunity here that um, enhances U.S. combat credibility. On campaigning, which is our second way in the strategy, that's really about day to day. How do we dynamically shift, be agile, make decisions, be opportunistic, and frame that deterrence, that integrated deterrence in a day to day way that tells an adversary today is not your day. You don't want to go after the United States today. Doing um, uh, doing that really does, again, get enhanced if you have more decision-making time and space, better indications and warning, faint signals, being able to read faint, faint signals from a broad array of different sectors and data, economic, um, informational, certainly military. So it's really inherently important there. Finally, building enduring advantage, our third way in the strategy um, is about making sure that we make the investments today, the seed corn today is invested in so that it harvests, we can harvest it in the long term. That's about our work for the, the space we're talking about. It's about making sure we have a strong workforce, we're technically competent, we have the processes from hiring processes to procurement processes in place to be agile, we know how to work with the commercial sector well. And this is a space where I think, again, we're, we're we want to demonstrate we can do all of those things, both with our own workforce, our own contracting, but also as part of a broader U.S. economic competitive um, um, space. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, tying two themes together, you talk about the strategy, you, talk, you made reference to the National Security Commission on AI report. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was, in many ways, the touchstone for us in developing the CDAO. Uh, regularly reviewing, consulting its recommendations. And you talked about the importance of thinking about AI within the tech stack, right? And bringing CDO is in many ways bringing some of the key building uh, blocks together of that tech stack. The NSCAI commission report also talks about the importance and the urgency of the department's pursuit of AI technologies in relation to the China competition. Um, is there anything in specific that's you know coming to your mind when you think about the NSCI recommendations or the China dynamic here 
that is important for us to understand for CDAO? Well, let me just say two things that uh, might not immediately come to mind uh, uh, for folks. But the first is, it, what it told me is we re need uh, world-class AI talent. Mm -hmm. And that explains Dr. Craig Martell as sure. the selection for CDAO and the great team that he has around him with Margie Palmieri and, and others. Um, but that's what it told me right there, which is the United States and the Department of Defense specifically needs to bring that kind of talent. We need to be able to access that talent, not just hire it, but we do need, um, uh, you know, uh, folks inside the system able to help us conceptualize and build out the kind of, um, um, you know, AI enterprise that we need. Um, I think the, the second thing I would go to, again, probably not necessarily where, where others might immediately, is the importance of the U.S. using AI, um, employing, having AI-enabled approaches that fit with our norms and the way we think about warfare. And that's where responsible AI is so important. We have right now underway a rewrite of the, um, of the DOD policy on uh, responsible AI um, we have been a leader in responsible AI. Uh, we have set the pace for allies and partners um, and uh, certainly for adversaries who have nothing like it. Um, and I think we can be very effective in warfare. We can create an effective deterrent and stick by our norms. And that's who we are as a people. That's really important to me that we advance that through CDAO. Absolutely. Um, in and what you're talking to, you're starting to scratch out a theory of change management for how you move the bureaucracy. I'd love to understand a little bit more about what your theory is. How do you think, sure. given the extensive experience you have here, how does CDAO, you know, and Dr. Craig Martel come and actually move the bureaucracy in a meaningful way? I think leadership is incredibly important. And um, the ways in which leadership uh, uh, speak, uh, use their time, drive the system, hold people accountable, will be a, a very important here. Um, the secretary and I are ready to be, you know, at the at the forefront of that, to be part of that change and to help Dr. Martel do the same along with the team in CDAO. So right at the top is leading and how we set our expectations and hold folks accountable. Um, part of holding folks accountable um, is eased substantially in terms of cultural change by aligning the incentives correctly. That can be very, very tricky here in the department because we are we have many cross-cutting incentive structures. We have within Title X, you know, different subcomponents of DOD that have different mandates as opposed to a corporation, in other words, where it kind of cleanly comes up to the top. We, of course, have um, uh, across the river, we have folks who have different views potentially and different from one another about what they think the department should be seeking to achieve and have the ability to, you know, line in, line out what our direction is. And so that creates some complications. Um, and, and there are others that are complicated, but I think that's the heart of how you change culture as you go after the incentive. So what's that theory for CDAO so far? Mm -hmm. And I am definitely um, going to be uh, looking to Dr. Martell to help us with his insights um, on, on how he thinks about change. Um, so far, part of our theory is showing um, particularly combatant commanders or commanders at the operational level what they wish they didn't couldn't live without. What what can they not live without? And um, you know, oftentimes they have no idea. They're perfectly happy with a grease board. You know, uh, just like I, people might have been perfectly happy with a printed map uh, to get them uh, through uh, cross streets in Washington D.C. You know, ten years ago. Whereas today, you can't live without your app, in particular if your app is crowdsourced and it has lots of information and things like that um, that help you navigate. Similarly, what we're finding is if you can show those use cases and they get back to what I said before, they get to the heart of the mission. Mm. And our mission is both to obviously deliver to the warfighter. It's also to deliver to the taxpayer. So we're mm. back to your, you know, um, opening, one of your opening questions. We want to go after both of those because the incentives inside our structure are different for different communities. So if we can save a lot of money, which we will be able to save a lot of money, if we can pay back through investments in our tech talent 
and our tools and our um, upgrades of software, you name it. We want to go after that to get some of that money back because that money can help the warfighter. Um, and it also goes to our mission as a responsible steward of taxpayer dollars. But more than anything, what we want to do is be able to find those use cases and unlock the potential for decision makers like the secretary out to the field, to the warfighter, um, to show them how they can achieve their objectives, their military objectives, operational objectives on behalf of the United States, better, smarter, faster with, um, with, these, um, tool, with this toolkit. Okay. Uh, probing just a little bit further on this topic, um, you mentioned our friends across the river. One of them is the Congress. And uh, one of the things CDA is going to need to do is try to find a way to help establish constituencies that can help get more attention on things like software as opposed to hardware yeah. and move in that direction. What advice do you have for uh, Dr. Martel and Margie mm -hmm. and the team in terms of how to build those types of constituencies that can actually meaningful change the direction the nation's going in? Sure. Well, there is a, a massive U.S. innovation ecosystem, and uh, it is increasingly focused on software rather than hardware. And that's true, of course, for defense as well. And so um, the ability to point to what the department can ignite in that industry and how we inter interact with industry, small businesses all the way up through, uh, you know, large global businesses um, I think that's a really strong place to start, demonstrating that we are part of an American competitiveness story, um, that it, we don't have to think about it as the defense industrial base, if you will, um, per se, although they're a big piece of how we go after this issue set, but we have to be really thinking about what DOD can do on behalf of the American competitiveness story. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I think second, I would say more functionally, you know, it's talking, it's ta telling the story, it's explaining those use cases I pointed to, that this isn't a science experiment, that we can demonstrate value. Value can be counted in dollars and value can be counted in mission success and lives saved. Um, and we will absolutely, we are already have some of those examples from Afghanistan and Ukraine just within the last year to work that's been undergo, uh, underway, for example, under the Jake with Game Changer and, and some of the other um, efforts that are longer standing. We just need to be better at telling that story. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about industry. Um, one of the things we heard a lot in establishing CDAO from small businesses, you know, large traditional primes, as well as the venture capitalist community is a real desire based on mission to try to work with the Department of Defense but yet still a lot of challenges in being able to access things given how long it can take for contracts to be awarded, given the opaque nature in certain cases about the regulations process they need to abide by. How do you think CDAO should play in that space and help establish stronger relationships with industry? Let me first say, um, I feel in no way defensive on this um, question and no one in the department should. We are extraordinarily difficult to work with. Um, and uh, there's a lot for us to shift in terms of our processes, some statutory issues, but mostly in our processes in culture and workforce training mm -hmm. and staffing. I mean, uh, particularly post-COVID, you know, we have some real staffing challenges throughout the department that then have compounding impacts on, on this issue of how we work with industry. So I think the first thing is, as in any 12-step program, acknowledge the problem. Um, so we need to acknowledge that we are a difficult uh, um, uh, partner and we need to get better. Then I think it's about how we go, how we go after it. I think there's a real, a part of the impetus I had in the CDAO is there's, there's, the, there's a power in bringing a, a vanguard organization with direct reporting relationship to me and to the secretary at the four-star level that can push us in these areas. Again, they can build on work that's been underway. We have a number of um, you know, procurement vehicles, for instance, already available. I think there's five mm -hmm. that are really focused on expanding the, the, our, our access in DOD to non-traditional companies. Um, we have the ability to be a vanguard on the workforce, um, the innovation workforce, and, and I have an effort underway on that. I'm very hopeful that CDAO will be right up there with ideas of how we get better at 
um, uh, both recruiting talent, but upskilling and reskilling, and then retaining some of that talent. Some talent we need to be really comfortable with it flowing in and out. I think that model is completely appropriate, and we just have to, we're not comfortable with that typically, so we need to get more comfortable with it. So those are some of the ways I think CDAO will be an exemplar. And again, I'll just say Vanguard, because it's more than an exemplar. They, this ought to be one of the places folks look at and say, that's the way we want to do this in government. This is government uh, going the right way, and it's at, hopefully we'll be able to do it at a scale that then translates, uh, helps us translate across the whole department. Okay, excellent. Uh, yesterday in one of the panels, we actually talked a bit about some of the obstacles the CDAO uh, could face in making the department help a, be better at adopting data analytics and AI at scale. You initiated at this forum a year ago, the ADA initiative, mm -hmm. which is all about accelerating uh, yeah. AI and data uh, uh, advantage. advantage. Thank no you. No worries. <laughs> yeah. The good news um, is I remember. It would be yeah. bad if I can't remember yeah, what right, ADA stands right. for. Yeah. Um, with that initiative, you know, it's, it's been a year since you've announced yeah. it, and uh, there's been a lot of effort underway in that regard. Are there some key lessons learned in terms of what's working or where you see more opportunities for CDO to help advance ADA and deliver mm -hmm. analytics and AI at the commands? Yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased with where we are a year in. That said, uh, you know, we can do more and we will do more, and we're always we're always chasing behind the curve, I think, on because of the pacing challenge that we face with China. Um, on ADA, what we found is there's a lot of enthusiasm out of the commands when we can get the teams out there. COVID, again, has been complicating to that easier more recently. Um, and we see a lot of natural use cases, questions that combatant commanders really want help answering and the, the ability to apply um, answers through ADA which by the way is named after Ada Lovelace. Mm -hmm. I have to stress because I've heard other people refer to it as ADA. So I wish, I wish to express right here, it's named after Ada Lovelace. Um, another thing we've seen is that there's, unsurprisingly, there's different maturity levels of throughout the department, of course, but also, of course, throughout the combatant commands. And so some are had already been further along their own journey on um, adoption of, of both AI and data um, than others. And so we're kind of, we're, we're by necessity sort of pacing to that. And then last I'd say, we're finding that many of the problems that we're, we're, we're seeing are common and or um, there are common solution approaches. And uh, because we're at the enterprise level at ADA, that's kind of the beauty of the federated approach. We have this centralized repository of knowledge and expertise and data um, and tools and contract vehicles um, and folks who understand how to use contract vehicles for this purpose. And then these problem sets can come in and we can tailor, if you will, more easily and get solutions out faster. I think that's what we've seen to date. It's a three year effort, meaning I'm funding it, if you will, for three years. Um, and we're going to see as we get through FY24 being the last of those years um, where we are with ADA and what the next natural evolution is. I think we should be very unafraid to shift uh, approaches as the stand-up of CDAO itself shows and, and uh, make sure we are ahead of the curve, not chasing a curve by being uh, committed to either particular initiatives and or to... Um, uh, organizational constructs. That said, again, I think ADA in and of itself is it is it, it is proving its worth. And I think anything that would follow it, ADA, it, it, whether it's called ADA or something else, naturally will build on what we do here. Mm -hmm. Great. Another one of your key initiatives is related to responsible AI. Yeah. Put out ethical principles. Uh, you, through the CDO construct, have actually elevated the role of responsible AI within the organization by having a chief of AI assurance who's a direct report to the CDAO, and will soon be putting forward an implementation plan uh, on our AI. What are your thoughts on how that's going and how the department's actually moving towards taking that seriously and being more responsible in the development of AI? I do think we're a leader in responsible AI. Um, the department got out early and then again, um, under Secretary Esper, put out some guidance. And again, I put out some guidance last year 
Um, and that has the benefit of demonstrating both that from the very beginning, if you will, back in 2012, when we when we last worked together, we were putting out you know responsible AI um, guidance, and that we are continuing that commitment, and that that commitment is bipartisan. That it's happened under both the last administration and this one. That's the good news. I I do think we're leading. I think that the the areas to grow. Um, are there the international community probably needs a, to push along further in this space. We will want to be a leader in that, but we also want the overall space of AI use um, to be governed responsibly. And there is a lot of room there. I think, again, with CDAO uh, being established at the four-star level, really elevating that responsible AI um, initiative uh, and bringing it into focus I, I hope that there's a lot of opportunity there to grow. Okay, good. Now with CDAO just achieving a full operating capability, uh, in many ways now the hard work begins for the organization. How are you going to evaluate its progress and what do you have in mind when you think about what success looks like for CDAO? Sure, well, I do think it's really important to empower the team there to, uh, first of all, take a little time as they put themselves together in FOC, um, to uh, think through that problem, set themselves, and put some uh, measures out that we can we can talk about. So I'm not I'm not going to get in front of that process. What I will say uh, is that we have to be able to deliver. Uh, we have to advance and advance quickly on the um, challenge set that the warfighter faces. And so inside the department, often this is all categorized under JAD C two, Joint All Domain Command and Control. Um, however one wishes to characterize it, what we want to be able to do is make sure we are leveraging the state of the art um, in order to increase accuracy, increase speed of decision making, increase uh, the quality of, the of our ability to deliver effects. And if we can do that, it helps again all the way back up to our mission. It helps us defend the nation in particular by um, demonstrating our ability to do integrated deterrence, enabling integrated deterrence and enabling campaigning. We really can't campaign effectively. We have tried uh, globally against a competitor um, with such um, significant work underway in the military and in other realms as China. Uh, just sort of hand jamming and PowerPoint sliding our way through that. Um, we need to be able to access the data that's out there, but we need to do it our way, not China's way, uh, back to the responsible piece. Um, and so we need to be able to have a system and approach uh, within the department and, and the CDAO has to be seen a year in as delivering on that and as the go-to place for talent um, and technical expertise to get after that problem. Excellent, okay. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time that we'll have for today to explore this topic, but thanks so much for finding the time to Absolutely. chat with me and share a little bit more of the logic behind the CDAO. It's and thank you, valuable. Jim, for your hard work standing up the CDAO. We would not be here today if it were not for all that you did. So that's thank you. That's kind of you to say, thank you. Yeah.